Hello everyone and Happy New Year. Uh, that solo was taken from a track I've just finished for my good friend and Canadian artist and songwriter Matthew Alexa and I thought this would be a really good opportunity to take you behind the scenes so to speak of a remote session and share with you my process. I've therefore broken this down into 10 steps and my hope is that you'll find this interesting or maybe even useful. So without further ado, let's get to it. Number one, meeting with the artist. So whenever I take on a new project, I always like to try and meet with the artist face to face. Now, of course, this can be done easily via Zoom. And the purpose being to really find out what the artist's vision is for their song. What are their influences? What are their references? What is the emotional driving force behind the track? Uh, and even down to technicalities like what sample rate do they want their files delivered in? Um, do they want mono, stereo, wet, dry, wet? Do they have a preference? So this is where I start to sketch out an initial brief for myself. Number two, homework. Now that I have some information from the artist, in regards to their musical influences or their musical vision for the track, I will generally create a Spotify playlist of these references, but I'll add in a few others. So it could be other releases by the same artist or other artists of a similar vein. The reason for this is that I want to let these influences kind of wash over me without being influenced by one thing too much. The danger with only using one reference track is that you might just end up ripping off those ideas. Whereas if you have, you know, let's say five or eight tracks that you are listening to in a playlist, you're gonna get a more general sense of what your direction is gonna to need to be when it comes to writing guitar parts. Once I have a playlist like this, I'll really just let it wash over me. So while I'm cooking breakfast or doing some other work, I'll have this stuff going on in the background so that I'm just kind of subconsciously taking in the details of it. Number three, put the guitar down. Uh, now, this sounds a little counterintuitive, but the first two to three times I listen to a track, I won't have a guitar anywhere near me. Um, I'll have a pad and I'll have a pen. And the idea here is that when I'm first approaching a track, I don't want to be listening to it as a guitar player. I want to be listening to it as a producer or even as a consumer. I'm listening for what the track needs and I'm trying to visualize those parts into existence. Being guitar players, we're very kind of um, shape focused. Sometimes uh, I use this expression with my students that our hands boss us around. We default to things that we already know. Um, whereas up here, we are uninhibited uh, by our fretboard knowledge or by our technique. We can imagine anything. And that's always how I approach sessions is I will imagine what I want to hear. And in the vein of this, where I have very specific references, where I'm looking at stuff where we have uh, Ray Parker Jr. or Paul Jackson Jr. or Michael Landau on guitar, then you know I'll be trying to imagine how those guys would approach it. I'd imagine those guys already on the record, and then it's just down to me to then find those notes on the guitar. Number four, best foot forward. Now, bearing in mind that at this point, I have created a kind of blueprint for myself and I won't have even necessarily worked out all the parts yet, but I might have things written down like mirror the synth hook in bar 16, um, add a funky, clean, tradic guitar part in the pre-chorus. It'll be stuff like that. It'll be kind of like instructions to myself. When it comes to actually picking up a guitar and starting to record, what I'll generally do is start with the parts that I feel most confident about. And uh, there's always a bit of a psychological game with music and uh, you don't want to find yourself getting stuck because it kind of psychs you out. So I start with something that I feel confident that is gonna work, and then that puts me in a good headspace and a good mood for plowing through um, the session with confidence. So in the case of this particular track, um, it was the popping line in the intro and the verses, which was one of the first things that I heard in my head. So that's what I started with.
Number five, strong foundations. This is the point in the process where I will begin to attack what I call the meat and potato guitar parts, those parts that are necessary to push the track along and to reflect the dynamics of each section. An example of this would be the main rhythm part in the chorus. This is something that definitely needed to happen to elevate the chorus slightly above the verses and the pre-chorus. But there's also a lot of information already in this section. We have bass, drums, keyboards. And so it becomes a case of listening to all of these things and being sympathetic to what is happening rhythmically and harmonically. And generally, making sure that you are enhancing rather than detracting from what is already there. Around the same point in the process, uh, I also start to latch on to what I call ear candy parts. These are little counter melodies that highlight things that are already happening in the track. Again, focusing on enhancing what the artist has provided you with. Number six, it is all about the vocal. You will not believe how much of my life I spend telling students this, it's all about the vocal. So it's really important that when you're writing parts that you are staying out of the way of those important vocal moments, that you are giving the vocal room to breathe and that if you are doing stuff at the same time that it is enhancing what is happening and not distracting from it. Um, the way I always put it to my students is, it's just a case of, do you want your guitar parts to be muted or not? Because when it comes to uh, a producer making decisions and it comes down to being you or the vocal, guess what? The vocal is gonna win, the vocal is king. Um, so it's really worth bearing that in mind while you're writing if you want your parts to make it onto the finished record. Number seven, development. So another classic trick of 70s, 80s, 90s session players is to differentiate your second verse from your first verse. I've heard of certain producers, I think it's Mutt Lang, who generally had a rule of no guitar in the first verse or the first half of the verse. Uh, and then have it kind of creep in and then develop into verse two. And this is just like a really good way to keep the song moving and to make it feel like it is progressing towards a destination. So in the case of this track, uh, I kind of kept the foundation of the popping part that I started out with, but then I just built on this, added a little bit more to it. And I also started to add in a couple more fills or kind of ear candy moments in the second verse so that it just feels like we are arriving somewhere new rather than circling back to somewhere we've already been. Number eight, tones. Let's uh, let's talk gear and stuff. So um, for this session, I was using uh, my PV Classic 50 throughout. Um, I had one overdrive pedal which I was using, which is the um, Tilt Overdrive by Rev. And I was using little bits here and there of compression. And I think I had one take where I was using a bit of the Dimension C for that kind of early 80s chorusing sound. Um, 
you don't need to have loads of gear to do this stuff. I'd say that you need to have a couple of guitars with different pickups or, you know, different neck or body woods. Um, and even if you only have one amp, um, you know, having a couple of different pedals that you can set differently uh, will get you there. The main thing about this is tonal contrast. Um, it's not about having one amazing guitar sound when it comes to recording. Um, you might do that for like a solo or something, but when it comes to layering parts, you're trying to find different colors that are complementary to each other. And sometimes that means dialing a sound a little bit brighter or a little bit darker or a little less gainier or a little more gainier than you usually would because you know that you are going to have another part which is the complement to it. Number nine, we're almost there. Solo and finishing touches. So I already have a video on this called the five T's of soloing, where I outline my mindset in regards to writing guitar solos. Uh, but my process is much the same as it is with rhythm parts, which is that I will sit down away from the guitar and try and imagine what I want to hear first. I'll try to latch onto some melodic themes. I'll think about the general trajectory of the solo. I'll think about where I want this to be moments of uh, flash or, or energy. And then, only then, do I pick up the guitar and start trying to find a few of these ideas? And then the process is usually a mixture of pulling melodies out of my head and improvising to get a rough sketch of an idea and then a refinement process of, of dialing it in. A lot of the time when you're working with fast phrases and stuff, what you end up needing to focus on is how you land it. Um, for example, the legato phrase at the end of the solo, uh, that was improvised, but then I had to take a minute to figure out how to get out of it in a way that made sense and didn't sound like I'd, you know, fallen off my horse. It's also this point where enough of the track is now there that you're getting a good idea about how it's going to sound when it's completed. And so you can start to go in with your little detail brush and just add in any additional moments that just help to enhance the emotional quality of it. So for me, uh, this was things like the uh, swells, which I was doing with the volume pedal and which were a lot more affected, a lot wetter, a lot more chorused, and a few additional fills here and there. Um, I also might go in and add some stuff on transitions just to smooth that kind of movement from choruses back into verses or whatever. We made it, number 10. Uh, at this point, this is where I will bounce out an MP3 of the track. At this point, I've kind of mixed the guitars how I would envision them being mixed in the track, maybe like a little bit louder so the artist can really hear what's going on. I will send it over to, in this case, Matthew. Uh, for him to have a listen to, he'll then come back to me with some feedback of, could we try changing this? How about an additional part here? And usually within one set of revisions, we've kind of got it. At this point, I will start to bounce out the files. Uh, generally what I'm doing at this point is um, centralizing all of the tracks, bringing them all up to a similar level. So they're a nice, nice, healthy level and then exporting them and labeling them carefully one at a time. Um, again, setting a bounce region within the project so that all the files are exactly the same length so that when it comes to uh, Matthew pulling them into his project, uh, they're all gonna line up um, they're all going to be a nice healthy level so it just becomes a case of panning and balancing for him. I'll also do a little bit of EQing so if there's fat that can be trimmed, uh, cutting out excessive low end for example or if there's any frequencies that are poking through in an unpleasant way I will deal with that stuff before I send it to him. Again what you're striving to do is really minimize the amount of work that the artist or the producer is having to do on their end and and hopefully by making it a pleasant and easy process for them, you're making yourself more hireable or hopefully putting yourself front of mind for future collaborative opportunities. On a side note, if you'd like to learn the solo at the beginning of this video and in the process support me in making more videos like this one, you can check out the Session Heroes Patreon page. You'll notice I don't have any uh, adverts switched on on pretty much any of my videos, so I don't make any money from YouTube. So 
The reason I'm able to do this with any kind of regularity is because of the support of my patrons. And as a thank you, um, if you're a patron of mine, you get access to exclusive video lessons. You get access to tablature for both stuff like this and also the covers I do of Dan Huff solos, Michael Landau, etc. Um, you get at least two top draw licks a month, which are generally like things that I'm working on in my own practice routine or stuff that I've transcribed from other players. And you can even request videos that you'd like to see in the future. Okay, folks, uh, that's it. Uh, I hope that you have found this interesting, um, maybe even useful. If you have any additional questions about um, this process, about the tech side of it, about gear, um, just drop it into the comments and I will definitely get back to you. Uh, but for now, I'll say over and out and uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys real soon. Take care. Bye.